And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Liz. Hello, welcome everyone. So today um, we're going to spend some time talking about the CAP program and hopefully giving you a better understanding of whether this will be a good program to help your institution. In today's webinar, I want to talk about the program itself, the process, and the benefits of participating. And then we're also going to talk about eligibility. And then Tiffany's going to talk about funding, costs, and she's going to go through a bunch of um, tips for applying. So the CAP is a program that's administered by the Foundation for the American Institute for Conservation under a cooperative agreement with the Institute of Muse Museum and Library Services. It's designed to help small and mid-sized museums by providing funding support for a general conservation assessment. CAP is often a wonderful first step for small institutions that wish to improve the condition of their collections and develop some long-range preservation plans. So what does a general conservation assessment consist of? So it's going to be a review of all the institution's collections, buildings, and building systems, as well as policies and procedures that relate to collections care. This is not going to be an item by item review of the collections, but rather more of a bird's eye overview of your collections. The goal is going to be to help the museums determine their greatest collections care needs. You know, we all struggle with limited time and limited money, and so the goal of CAP, of the CAP assessment is to help you determine what, where to invest your limited resources and how best to improve the care of those collections. So how does the CAP process work? The most important thing is that this is going to be a team process. The internal aspect of that team is going to be your staff, your board members, and your volunteers. We really encourage you to get as many people involved in this process as possible. It helps your assessors get a more well-rounded understanding of your museum, and it really helps create institution-wide buy-in for the recommendations that you'll have in your report. The other members of your CAP team are your assessors. Most museums will have two assessors, one who has a collections background, usually a conservator, and one with a building background, which may be an architect, an engineer, or a historic preservationist. The two assessors will work collaboratively to create a prioritized recommendations for your improved collections care. And the assessment will culminate, oh, sorry, I skipped ahead there. The, assess the assessment's going to culminate in a comprehensive report that will be written by your assessors and will include all of the prioritized recommendations that they develop through their two-day site visit for your collections care. So next, let's go into the process. So the CAP process is going to take about a year, and it's comp comprised of eight steps. And I'm kind of going to walk you through each one of those steps. The first step is the application process, and those that opens November 1st this week and will be open until February 1st of 2019. Um, museums will be notified in March of their acceptance. Once accepted, the institutions will select two assessors. We provide a list of approved assessors that they can review and interview. And once the assessors are selected, the museum will provide background information to their assessors. This will be the, in the form of what we call a site questionnaire. We will provide the museums with the questionnaire, and it will ask specific questions about your organization, your collections, your buildings, your building systems, and also your policies and procedures. The site questionnaire will really help your assessors get to know your museum before they do their two-day site visit. And then as you near your site visit, the next step you'll see is that um, you'll hold a pre-site visit phone call with the assessors. The goal of this call is to introduce members of the project team to one another and also allow the assessors to ask questions and get to know your institution, their goals, and your concerns. It will be a time for you to organize the schedule for your site visit and it's really helpful for this preparatory phone call. You'll be able to, um, to get everything in order and ready to go before the site visit itself. Now the next step is the site visit, and this is the big part of the CAP. 
During the two-day site visit, the assessors are going to tour all of your collections, your buildings, your exhibition spaces. They're going to look at things like the lighting, storage materials you're using, all of your environmental controls. They're going to look at your staff, the roles, and how they relate to collections care. Um, they'll want to look at any policies and procedures that you have and a number of other things that are going to affect the general preservation of your collections. They may also want to meet with other staff, board members, volunteers. Um, so it's going to be a pretty full two days. Um, this culminates then in the written report, which contains prioritized recommendations for your improved collections care at your site. And then we get to the implementation process, and staff should hopefully begin implementing the report's recommendations. And what we hope is that this report will really serve as a living, working document for your institution that can really guide you in both the short term and the long term. And then finally, we have what we call the follow-up, and that is about 12 months after the initial site visit. The institution will have an opportunity to um, reconnect with their assessors through a phone call or a video chat, and they can report on their progress, um, request further advice, and address any other challenges that may have arisen in between receiving the report and beginning to do some of these implementation aspects. So let's see. The sample cap executive summary. Next, I kind of want to talk about, give you an idea of some of the recommendations that you might find in a final report. Every CAP report is going to contain what we call an executive summary that serves as a prioritized list of recommendations. Though you may be aware of some of these issues already at your institution, an assessment can really help you decide where to invest limited resources and staff time. What you see here is not a complete list of recommendations, nor are they even all from one single report, but it can give you a general sense of what types of things might be included. The first thing I want to point out is how they are categorized. We think that having a prioritized list of recommendations is important so that you don't feel overwhelmed with a bunch of recommendations and you might not even be sure where to start. This example has recommendations organized by critical, high, medium, and low priority. But other reports might use immediate, short, and long term, or one year, three years, and five years. There's a variety of ways in which the assessors might organize their findings. And they do that based both on their own preference and the needs they see for your institution. The other thing I want to point out is that some of these recommendations, like developing a written collections management policy, they require only an investment of staff and board time. But others, like you see at the end, um, needing to have an HVAC system, are going to require likely funding and more time to implement. So it's typical in an executive summary to have a range of different types of recommendations. I should also note that the summaries are much longer than this, and they would often have more than just a few recommendations. But here, we just wanted to share with you a few examples. So how can CAP help your museum? There are many benefits to the CAP program. As busy professionals, it can be challenging to be able to take a step back and really look at some of the bigger needs of the institution to do long-range planning. And that is something that CAP can really be helpful in getting you started on that process and providing that path forward. In addition, if you're interested in seeking grant funding, or private support for conservation or preservation activities, a CAP report can provide the professional argument that is needed for such work. And bringing in an outside consultant to identify the need can really help in adding um, some much needed weight to a grant application. Having an outside perspective can also be valuable in drawing the attention of your board or other leadership and community partners to collections care concerns and help to engage them and create a sense of momentum for addressing a lot of these concerns. So I wanted to talk, we've talked about what CAP does and what its benefits are, but I also wanted to review quickly what CAP is not. We unfortunately are not, um, we do not provide grant funding for collections care 
or implementing the CAP findings. CAP also does not provide individual conservation treatments or object-by-object -object level surveys. It is meant to be a broader look at the collections and the building systems, as well as your policies and pr procedures. So a much more bird's eye overview of your institution. The program emphasizes preventative conservation and what you can, as an institution, do to create the best environment for the items in your collection. So now that we've discussed that, I want to talk a little bit about what um, eligibility is for the CAP program. So you see here are um, the lists of different museum types. All the museums you see listed here are going to be eligible. Museums that hold collections, living or non-living, such as botanic gardens, arboreta, and zoos, can also use the CAP to have both types of collections assessed. The rule, generally speaking, is that if you have collections and you make them available to the public, you're probably going to be eligible. With that said, though, libraries and archives are not going to be eligible for CAP. The reason for this is due to our funding. The funding for CAP comes through IMLS and the Museum Services Division specifically. And there are other opportunities for libraries and archives to apply for similar types of programs, but the CAP program is intended for museums. Now, if you're a museum that has an archive, don't worry, you're probably eligible. If you have questions about any of this, please just give us a call. We can, we'd be happy to talk through with you your individual circumstances of your institution and eligibility. The CAP program is funded through the Institute of Museum and Library Services, so therefore the program serves those institutions defined as museums. And we understand that many of the museums have archival materials, and that's okay. So long as your institution has the objects and identifies primarily as a museum and not as an archive or library, you will probably be eligible. So let me go through the rest of the other eligibility requirements. First, you must be a nonprofit organization or a unit of state, local, or tribal government, basically non-federal. If your institution exists within a multi-purpose public or private nonprofit organization, such as a municipality or a university, you are also eligible for CAP. The second is that your institution must be located in the United States. But this also includes the District of Columbia and all U.S. territories. Thirdly, your institution must be organized on a permanent basis for educational or aesthetic purposes. This means that art centers or galleries whose primary purpose is the promotion and sale of art, for example, would not be eligible for the CAP program. And fourth, the institution must own tangible objects that make them available to the public through exhibition and or research on a regular basis. You may have seen other IMLS programs or grants that require your institution to be open to the public for a minimum number of days per year to fulfill eligibility, but the CAP program does not have that requirement. We simply um, say that you, you need to show a commitment to regular public access in your institution. The fifth is that your institution must employ at least one full-time person or the equivalent of a full-time person. This person does not have to be paid, and you may have a very dedicated group of volunteers that put in the equivalent of 40 hours per week, but there does need to be a workforce that can oversee the assessment, and most importantly, work on implementing the report's recommendations after the assessment. And finally, it must be possible for the assessors to review all of your collections and facilities in a two-day site visit. If you've never had a conservation assessment before, you might not know how to determine whether your site can be assessed in two days. What we would suggest is to really think about your whole site or sites. Think about the collection storage areas you have, your exhibition spaces, all of your buildings. Now, this isn't an object-by-object -object assessment, but your assessors do need to spend time visiting all of these sites. They need to be observing the environments there, talking to staff, and dealing with the issues related to each of those spaces. And they also, um, they'll be taking notes throughout the whole process to kind of come up with preliminary recommendations to discuss with you during their site visit. And they need to be able to do all of this within two eight-hour days. 
So just kind of think about all of that. But if you're really unsure of any of that, please don't hesitate to give us a call. We'd be happy to walk through the particulars of your own museum and whether you think it would be possible to do a two-day site visit at your institution. So now that I've discussed eligibility, I wanted to again run through quickly who is not eligible for CAP. Agencies of the federal government, um, that's because of our funding source, comes through IMLS, which is a federal agency. And institutions that serve primarily as libraries or archives are not eligible, which we talked about uh, a couple slides ago. Historic structures without collections are also not eligible. If you are just a historic building, and there are no collection items beyond the building, then that would make you ineligible for the CAP program. Also, if you don't own your collections, you're not eligible. If the objects in your collections are on loan, and if you are responsible, for example, for caring for collections, um, but they're still held in private hands, unfortunately, you would not be eligible. It is fine, though, if some of your items are on loan, but the majority of the museum's collections need to be owned by the institution. Institutions with collections that take more than two days to be assessed are also not eligible, which is something we discussed. And But again, if you have any questions about any of this, please don't hesitate to ask us. And with that, um, I think I'm going to hand things back over to Tiffany All so right, she thank can you, discuss Liz. funding and tips okay, for Okay, so let's talk about funding. Institutions that participate in the CAP program receive an allocation to help pay for their assessor's fees. That allocation amount will range from $3,500 to $3,900 per assessor, and that's based on the annual operating budget of the institution, as shown in this chart. So, for example, if your annual budget is $150,000, you would receive an allocation of $3,900 for a collections assessor and $3,900 for a building assessor. So I should clarify, CAP is not a grant because the funding doesn't flow directly to participating institutions. Instead, the allocation is paid by FAIC to the assessors. The institution is then responsible for paying the remainder of the assessment costs. So all CAP assessors are independent contractors, and so they often perform the same type of general conservation assessment to other institutions outside of the CAP program. So they've all set their own professional fees, um, and we cannot, as an organization, tell them what their fees should be. Um, so I'm going to just give you an example here on the next slide. Um, so in this example, Remember, this is just for one contract with one of the two assessors. We can say that the collections assessor that was chosen here charges a professional fee of $3,900. And her travel expenses to get to the site um, to cover mileage and food and hotel are, let's say, $500. That assessor's total fee would be $4,400. So if the cap allocation was $3,900, then the museum here would be responsible for the remaining $500. Last year, it looked like the average museum contributed around $800 total for both assessors to the process, but the amount really does vary. Um, it can vary based on the location, um, the type of assessor you've chosen, um, the time of year. There are a lot of different factors involved. So if you are applying for the program and you're working on your 2019 budget, we do encourage you to be prepared and budget some cash costs for this process. I know it's difficult, but we can't tell you exactly what that's going to be. Um, but uh, the good news is you do get to choose your own assessors, so you have a little bit of control over those costs. Oop. Oh no, it looks like I'm missing a slide. Um, so the, uh, the other thing we want you to know is that beginning this year, museums are required to show a one-to-one -one cost share on their cap allocation. 
So if you've received a $3,900 allocation for each assessor or a total of $7,800, you need to show at least $7,800 worth of investment in the project from your institution. Now that does not mean that you have to provide $7,800 in cash. Uh, in addition to the costs that you pay for uh, assessor fees and travel, the cost share can be achieved through staff, uh, volunteer, and board time spent on the project. It can come from in-kind expenses and overhead expenses. We have a couple of examples on the website of how museums might meet that cost share, and I encourage you to take, take a look at that um, to show you some ways in which you might meet the match. I should also mention that all museums that are accepted in the program will also have an orientation webinar in which we'll talk more about cost share in greater detail. Uh, we'll have forms and trackers for museums to complete to help keep track of everything and to give you ideas as to what you can count for cost share. Okay, so Liz mentioned this earlier, but again, the applications for the next program cycle will open this Thursday, November 1st, and you'll have plenty of time to work on them. They won't close until February 1st. Um, and Liz also mentioned that we expect museums to be notified of their application status in March, though I'm going to pause here and say that funding is always subject to the availability of funds in the federal budget. But assuming that everything goes smoothly, um, we will uh, announce uh, the application acceptance in March, and then all assessment activities need to take place in 2019. So if your museum is not prepared to go through the entire CAP process in 2019, uh, you might want to consider waiting and applying for the 2020 program cycle. So now I want to move on to tips. I'm going to count down the top eight tips for applying to the CAP program. And to start out, you're going to need to create an account with our online application platform. So anytime after Thursday, if you go to our website, with conservation-us.org slash CAP, at the top of the page, you'll find an apply button. That apply button will take you to our application page. And once you're there, you'll click on that purple button right uh, toward the bottom of the page. And that will take you to our account page. You'll need to create a new account by clicking on the link on the right side that's circled there. Creating the account will allow you to log out whenever you want. And then the next time you hit that purple button on our apply page, you'll log back in on the left hand side of the screen where it's just asking you for your login ID and password and your saved application will be waiting for you. So you can log in and log out as many times as you want. When you click on um, that circled link to create a login, you're going to go to our uh, log or account profile form. And the one thing I wanted to point out here is that only the fields that have that nice little red R next to them are required. We use the online accounts for a lot of different purposes, and so there's a lot of uh, information that's collected for different reasons, but um, some of them may not apply to you, a lot of it may not apply to you. Really just focus on those fields that have the R next to them and are required. Um, another bonus tip I have here is to save your password um, and make sure you know which email address you use to register. Again, you'll need that information in order to log back in to continue working on your application. And you'll also want to hold on to it after you submit the application because we use these same accounts to give you access to uh, additional products down the road if you end up participating in the program. So save your passwords. And also, on an added note, if there are multiple people on your inst at your institution that are working on the application, you do all have to share the same login credentials. Um, only one email profile can be connected to an application, unfortunately. Okay, so after you fill out the basic contact information, you're going to end up uh, at a new screen that asks for social media information. This is not relevant to you. Um, you can just click the cancel button and ignore it. 
Um, and then, unfortunately, that will not take you directly back to the application. You will need to uh, go back to the Apply page on the CAP website and hit that purple button again to log in. Um, I wish it was a little smoother, but um, hopefully uh, it's not too confusing. My other tips are much quicker, I promise. Um, so tip number seven is to make sure you're eligible. Um, what I'm showing you here is a list of actual questions from the application. These are the questions we use to determine your eligibility, and they should look familiar. It's just the question version of the checklist that Liz shared with you a little bit earlier. If you can't confidently say yes to all of these questions, just contact us before moving forward in the application, and we'll, we'll talk through your eligibility with you. Tip number six, and again, Liz mentioned this earlier, rally your team. If you're considering applying to CAP, this is the best advice I can give you, is to rally your team around the process early on. You want to engage your colleagues and your board. Um, on the application, we do require that a board director or a similar organizational leader sign your application and say that they support the process. So the earlier you can get them invested in the process, the better. I also say rally your team during the application process because there may be questions that you may not be able to answer without assistance. We ask about um, your, your annual budget, for example, and that may be something that someone else needs to answer for you. And then more importantly, the real work for CAP starts once the assessment report is completed and your museum has to implement the recommendations that you have. And Really, the earlier you can get folks on board uh, in this process and invested in the results of the report, the better. Tip number five, choose your project contact wisely. This may, be, this may seem obvious, but um, this is the person uh, we ask for on your application um, to be the, the primary contact. Um, we will contact this person with any questions we have about the application, uh, and it's also the person we'll reach out to about program acceptance. So you want to make sure you've chosen someone who you think will respond promptly um, and who's engaged and available in the spring, January, February, March, that's still late winter, um, when we're making these, uh, when we're reaching out to applicants. You also want to make sure that the contact can answer questions about the collection if we have questions about the answers on the application, or at least knows who to ask to get those answers. Tip number four is to make sure your staff time adds up to at least one full-time equivalent. So on the application, we ask you to list the members of your staff who work with collections and exhibitions, along with their average hours per week. This is how we're double checking to make sure that you meet the eligibility requirement of at least one full-time staff member or full-time equivalent. Remember, these don't have to be paid positions, but the hours you list should add up to the equivalent of a full-time position. We've had questions about what we mean by works with collections and exhibitions here. Um, I don't mean this to be a narrow definition, so we're not looking just for your collections manager, registrar, there are a lot of different ways that people work with collections. Um, they protect them as security guards. They clean them. Um, they show them off to the public in tours. So you can include anyone here who has really has access to the collection and some degree of responsibilities related to them. I'd also add that all of the people who you list here should be involved in the site visit later on. Tip number three is to answer questions to the best of your ability. None of the questions are intended as trick questions. We do our best to make the questions relevant to you no matter what type of museum you work for. Um, but if you're not sure how to interpret a question, just reach out and email or give us a call. Oop, the line's a little weird there. But tip number two is to be honest um, and don't be scared of the questions. Not all of them are eligibility questions. So I've highlighted a question here, does your organization own all of the land and building it occupies? Um, I point this out because we had an applicant a couple of years ago reach this question and say, oh man, we don't own our land. 
so we must not be eligible. I'm not going to apply. Um, they did happen to reach out to us and we said, no, 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 please apply. Um, we have this question in here because if you say no, you don't own the land or building, we just will try to encourage you to get the land or building owner involved in the process and to meet with the assessors and um, to be part of the process. Um, so don't assume that uh, questions are eligibility questions. And then my final tip is always, as we've said throughout, just give us a call with any questions you have. Every museum is unique and um, we can't address all of the uh, specifics of every type of institution here, um, but we'd be happy to talk to any of you about your individual concerns or questions at any time. So with that, uh, we do have some time for questions now, so feel free to um, type any questions you have into that discussion box. If I don't believe we've seen any yet, but I will pause for a few minutes and see if anyone has any questions. Okay, it looks like I have a few people typing, so that's good. Oh yes, Maureen asked if um, we can get a recording. Yes, I will be downloading the recording here, um, and we will put it on the website at conservation-us.org slash cap. Um, it'll be on the apply page of the website. Um, it might take us a couple of days to do that, um, but we'll get it up there as soon as possible. Um, Ruth, let's see, it looks like uh, you're asking if we have a case study or an example report of the revamped cap process. Excellent question. We're working on a sample report. Um, as you can imagine, if you have um, been through a CAP assessment or really if you're interested in it, um, it's not something you necessarily want to share a uh, your own um, dirty laundry out there with for other institutions, but um, we're uh, creating a pretend report essentially. Um, that we can share to give everyone a sense of what the report might look like. Um, for those of you who don't know, the CAP program, uh, there was a, a former program known as CAP that was administered by an organization called Heritage Preservation a number of years ago. Um, and it was just a slightly different process. Um, and uh, I think the biggest difference is that uh, in the former CAP program, if your museum was not housed in a historic structure, you only had one assessor, just a collections assessor. Um, we believe that every museum, even those museums that were built last year, um, have structural issues that uh, impact collections, and um, the building is really the first line of defense in protecting your collections. So um, we now have Every museum receives an allocation for both a collections assessor and a buildings assessor, and they work together on a single report. Um, so yes, again, that's my long answer to the, the question of whether we will have an, a sample report. Um, what we'll do is we'll post that on the website. Um, it's getting proofread now. Um, so while I'd love to have it up November 1st, it's probably not going to happen, but um, it will be up before the end of the year for sure. Tiffany. Um, Karen, sorry, go ahead, Liz. Liz is going to read the questions for me, so I'm not just um, talking to myself. The next question says, one of our museums is owned by us, by the city and leased to us. Do we need a city employee to be involved in the site visit? Um, so need, no. Um, what I would suggest is if there's somebody that you uh, report to at the city who is going to be good to have on your side. 
um, it wouldn't hurt to have them stop by for a half hour and, and introduce them to the assessors. Um, the reason I say that is if um, if the museum needs their support um, for any of the impl implementation activities. Um, so if your um, if your assessors say, "Hey, you need a new HVAC system," um, the city is more likely to to agree with you and support you and help fund that. If um, if they are uh, engaged early on and have some sort of trust in, in the process. That's our recommendation. Um, every relationship is a little different, so um, if, if you don't feel that would be of value to you, that's fine, but we would encourage it. The next question is, must a CAP assessment review the entire collection, or can the assessor consider one sector of the collection, for example, the art? Oh, good question. Yeah, they do need to review the entire collection. Um, that's partially how we determine size. Um, otherwise, every museum would be eligible because we could just look at smaller and smaller aspects of the collection. Um, but also because the, um, the assessment is intended to be focused on preventive conservation, um, the, the things that they're looking at really do affect the entire collection. So if they're looking at your uh, climate control or um, the policies that you have in place, your collections management policy, so those are things that affect the entire collection. Um, and so looking at just one cross-section of the collection may have uh, a negative impact on uh, a different cross -sec section. So what might be best for the art may not be as good for the film. Uh, and so they need to have a general understanding of your entire collection in order to make decisions and recommendations that will be best for the collections as a whole. So I have two questions here that I think are related. The first is, we are fortunate to have some funding on hand for our assessment. What would be the best next step? To write an RFP and contact um, conservators using your Find a Conservator link? And the other question is, does the program provide a list of qualified assessors, or is that up to us to find? Great question. So we, um, so I'll answer the, the uh, question about assessors first. Um, we do maintain a pretty elaborate spreadsheet of our approved assessors. We have about 60 collections assessors and about 60 building assessors. Um, and we provide a lot of information about them. Um, so we don't put them on the website uh, with all of our information uh, and all of their information just because the spreadsheet can be a little unwieldy and we do um, provide a little more un information about interpreting that spreadsheet in the program orientation. Um, but that said, I'm happy to share the list of uh, assessors with um, uh, with anyone, if you want to just email me um, or Liz, we'll, we'd be happy to send you that list. Um, museums who are approved through CAP can definitely um, select from uh, the assessors that already exist, or if you have an assessor who's met our eligibility requirements for assessors, uh, we'd be happy to add a new assessor to the list. So sometimes museums come to us with a pre-existing relationship with someone who is a qualified assessor. So um, we go through the process with them of getting them up to date on the CAP process, and uh, that's absolutely fine. And then to kind of back up and answer the first part of that question, um, if you're lucky enough to have funding on hand and want to do this outside of the formal CAP program and you're just looking to um, uh, for assistance on the process, um, you, it would probably be best to just shoot us an email offline and uh, we can, again, provide you with that spreadsheet and anything else that would be helpful. So we have a question here. Are the assessor fees the only cost of the CAP assessment? Um, so in terms of cash costs, yes. Whatever the assessor uh, list as their fees are what you will pay in cash. Um, again, thinking about the uh, cost share requirement, there are always, um, there's the cost of staff time, which is something that you're, you're paying for already, but that is redirected into the CAP process. 
Um, same with board time. Um, but yeah, cap, uh, I'm sorry, the assessor fees, meaning their professional fees and their travel expenses are the only cash costs. The next question is, are there going to be slides made available after the presentation? So what we'll do is we'll put the recording up on the website. If you want just the slides, I can send those to you if you send me an email and ask for them. For approved applicants, will assessors submit invoices directly to FAIC in the awarded amount? Great question. So what they usually do is once they've completed the, um, the final report, they submit their invoice to us and copy you. Um, and then FAIC pays the assessors directly um, for the allocation amount. And then the amount over the allocation amount will be taken care of by your institution. So um, I'm not sure if this is what you're asking, but we get uh, asked a lot if the museum has to front the money. So do they, do you have to, does the museum have to pay for all of the costs and then get um, reimbursed for the allocation amount? And that answer is no. Um, the assessor receives two sets of payment, one from the museum and one from FAIC. The next question asks, what are your scoring criteria or what qualifies an organization? Good question. Um, so we look for a lot of things. Um, we look at eligibility primarily um, and pull aside all of the museums that are eligible for the program. Um, then we are looking at your, um, your answers to the questions um, to try and gauge the need of the museums. Um, we also look at diversity in terms of um, the types of museums that apply on geographic locations around the US. Um, we want to make sure that we're not funding only art museums in Wisconsin, for example. Um, but it's kind of a holistic look at the applicants. Um, so my my biggest recommendation is to make sure you are um, creating a good case for the need for a CAP assessment at your institution. And um, even more importantly, make sure you're filling out the application correctly and um, that you've read the eligibility requirements closely. The next question asks, how can conservation.org help with getting grants for the implementation? Um, so I, if, I think maybe you're asking how FAIC can help with getting grants. Um, and the, um, the answer to that would be we, we do try to provide some resources for grant funding um, for um, projects related to implementation. Um, so on the website, there's a resources page for CAP. Um, and there's a funding resources option underneath that. So we list some uh, grants that are state grants and federal grants primarily. Um, and then just having, as Liz said earlier, just having the CAP report can be a really great um, kind of testimonial to your need for grant funding. Um, but FAIC itself does not distribute any funds related to um, conservation uh, project funding. So we can't turn around and help directly with implementation uh, opportunities. The next question is asking, do we have any guidelines to determine if a collection is small enough to survey in two days? Oh, I wish we did. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of a magical discussion uh, that happens. Um, and Probably the best way we can do this is to talk about it one-on-one -on -one through a phone call. Um, for those of you who um, who are concerned about the size and you do go ahead and apply, um, if we're concerned we and think you may be kind of a bit too large to assess, we're not going to just throw you in the ineligible pile. We are going to follow up with a phone call and say, hey, you look like you have a lot of stuff to assess and maybe you have multiple buildings. Um, it may be tough. Let's talk about it and, and see if we can 
you know, talk through it together and see if you can convince us that it's actually possible to assess your collection in two days. Do we need uh, to name assessors in our application or do we choose them after being accepted into the program? No, you don't have the opportunity to name assessors in the application. In fact, we don't even share the approved assessor list until after um, museums are accepted. So don't have to worry about that at all. Uh, it's something we help with and help you think about what to consider when choosing an assessor after you'd be accepted in the program. Does the size of a museum have any bearing on the awards? Um, so definitely if we think the museum is too large to be assessed in two days, then um, that would obviously have an impact. Um, and then also size in terms of diversity. So we're not looking for all of the smallest museums and we're not looking for all of the biggest museums, but that's one of uh, the things that we might consider when, um, when looking at the whole range of applications. And I should say, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask myself a question. Um, we get a lot of questions about how many CAP, uh, um, how many uh, museums we can fund in a year. And I don't think I mentioned that today. Um, we, it depends every year, um, but we expect to be able to fund about 75 museums in 2019. So it's a good number. Some of our staff are on a per project consulting basis, uh, the curator, for example. So how would we count that with the hours and the time on the application? That's a good question. I would say you would need to do your best um, to estimate how much time they would spend on the assessment. Um, you know, I, that's, a, I think, a, a real um, uh, popular or common situation uh, for museums, uh, especially now. So um, I would just do your best to estimate what your um, uh, what you anticipate will be their time commitment during the assessment pro process. I think that might be all the questions. We, it looks like we have a couple other people typing. Could wait a second here. Great. We can wait just another minute to see if anyone else has any questions. Um, but again, feel free to send those to us directly as well. And I, I listed this on uh, this slide, but didn't say it. Um, I personally will be out of the office uh, conveniently November 5th through 16th, um, but uh, Liz will be able to answer any questions that you have during that time. OK. Oh, I think it looks more. like oh, Would archaeological collection specialists be available as assessors? Yes, we do have um, specialists who focus on archaeological collections. Yes, we do have a, a variety of backgrounds. And again, I'm happy to send that list. If you send me an email, I can send you the, um, the backgrounds for uh, different assessors so you have an idea of, of everyone on the list. But we have some living collections assessors, and we have folks with specialties in a lot of different areas. Um, the selection may not be as big in archaeological archeo collections as in other collections, but um, we definitely have assessors who specialize in that area. I think that's it then. Great. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, and I hope we'll see many of you, uh, your names come up in applications as they roll in over the next few months.